seeing the events of the Black Lives Matter and the Stop the API hate movements unfold in the past years has made a drastic impact on his life and he helps to generate more awareness by using his art. Next slide. Uh, the next three panels were done by Brandon No, who's an English creative writing major and art minor and he's an aspiring graphic novelist. So the first panel shows Vincent proposing to his fiance. And then this panel shows what happened after the altercation at the bar. So Michael Nitz, who was actually the stepson of Ronald Evans, is holding Vincent Chin. And Ronald Evans uses that baseball bat to bash Vincent in the head with very hard blows. And he died uh, days later. Next slide. And then Vincent's wedding turned into his funeral. Next slide. This panel shows Vincent's mother, Lily Chin, and her heartbreak over her son's death. And it was done by a student named Michelle Dharma, who is an Indonesian American um, studying biology and computer science at UIC. And she's actually doing a series of paintings of iconic photographs that reflect different historical events in Asian American history. So uh, if you're interested in seeing more student work, you could go to our UIC Global Asian Studies Program's website and look for a glass like Luza. These are online, but they're also on exhibit physically at the Asian American Resource and Cultural Center at UIC which is at um, 723 West Maxwell. Um, and it's going to be there till September. So um, that's a very brief overview of what happened. And then I'm just going to summarize what happened in the courts. So with the criminal court trial, as you saw, Evans and Nitz were only sentenced to years probation and fines. There was no police investigation conducted. The bat wasn't even taken evidence, no witnesses were questioned, um, and you know, in the documentary we see a lot of witnesses who could have been uh, important um, uh, witnesses. And next slide. Um, the judge said these aren't the kind of men you send to jail. You fit the punishment to the criminal, not the crime, and the Detroit Free Press uh, said the sentencing suggests that the lives of the killers are a greater value than the life of the slain victim. Um, then you see a little bit of, next slide, you see in the documentary the formation of a group called the American Citizens for Justice, and it was great to see someone addressing us tonight um, and telling us about that organization. It was established in March 1983 and became, became a pan-Asian multiracial um, national Organization to Fight Justice. They pursued investigations and organized protests, media campaigns. This was before you know, social media. Um, and that really made a difference and led to the U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI launching an investigation. I think they're also really important because it leads later to a group called the National Asian Pacific American Legal Consortium and they began doing yearly audits of hate crimes against Asian Americans. They are now called the Asian American Justice Center. Um, and I just wanted to note something about the name American Citizens for Justice. At the time, it was really an important point that people wanted to make that Asian Americans were American uh, because of the long history um, of exclusion of Asians from citizenship and from immigration that has led to this idea that Asians are not American. Next slide. So in the American Citizens for Justice investigations, um, they found out that um, one of the dancers heard even say to Chin, it's because of you mother hubbards that you're out of work. Excuse my language. Um, and in that context, that even though a racial slur wasn't used, it's clearly referring to Japanese or Asian people. Um, and this became uh, really important 
and a huge challenge to convince people that racism against Asians actually existed. And that's another challenge for Asian Americans with the model minority stereotype that posits Asians do not face racism. Um, next slide. two civil rights trials. In the first one, Evans was indicted for violating Chen civil rights um, and sentenced to 20 years. Uh, but then an appeal led to a retrial, and that resulted in a not guilty verdict. Um, so the first trial was the first time the federal government actually pursued a civil rights case on behalf of an Asian American. And I think that's really significant. Um, and then in the retrial, the racial bias of this system clearly favored Evans. Um, I'll just share one uh, fact. Out of 180 potential juries in the jury pool, only 19 people had even casual contact with an Asian American before. Um, any juror who had a friendship or connection with an Asian American was dismissed, but no potential juror who as white friends were um, dismissed. Next slide. So uh, finally, there was a wrongful death civil suit for the loss of Vincent's life that rendered a settlement for $1.5 million, and Evans actually stopped making payments on that in 1989. Um, so I just wanted to quote Evans from the film, he said, the system worked for him right down the line. So that's a really quick overview of what happened in the court cases. And I'm gonna stop with the slide deck and just share a little bit about my experience teaching Vincent Chin and what I think is significant about teaching American history. So uh, learning about Vincent Chin hits many students very hard. I teach college students who are often learning about Asian history for the first time in their lives because they haven't been taught in K-12 schools. They ask questions about why they haven't learned about this case and why they haven't learned at all about Asian Americans facing racism. And that's important for all students to learn, for Asian Americans to learn their own history and to be able to have a context for their own experiences, for other students of color to see commonalities and shared struggles and not assume that Asian Americans do not face racism, and for white students to engage and see ways for them to become anti-racist. So in Asian American Studies classes, students learn a longer history of anti-Asian racism that's about systemic and institutionalized oppression, but they also learn that many Asian Americans have fought against that racism and broader injustices and that they have fought with other communities of color. So all of those are really important. And the very start of Asian American Studies is a good example. The fight for Asian American Studies was part of what was called the Third World Liberation Front at San Francisco State in 1969. When students went on strike, Asian American students, black students, Chicano students, indigenous students, fought for and won the first College of Ethnic Studies in the country. They wanted school curriculum that reflected their own histories that were left out of the Eurocentric histories and cultures being taught. They also wanted more access to higher ed for communities that had been kept out of elitist um, institutions that were white, male, and wealthy. It was also around that time that two graduate students at University of California, Berkeley, created the term Asian American. So up until then, people used the word Orient. Um, and so ethnic studies began in 1969. It's taken a long time for many colleges and universities to develop Asian American studies programs. Most have been fought for by students. Here in Chicago, UIC's uh, started in 2010, and I'm really happy to report that we're launching a major this fall. Uh, Northwestern universities came about through a student membership. Um, so most K-12 schools 
still teach very little about Asian Americans. My own kids have really not learned very much more than I did. Um, and I'm older than you think I am. Um, so it's really great that in April 2021, Illinois became the first state to pass legislation to mandate the teaching of Asian American history. It's called the Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History, or TEACH Act. And other states are um, also doing similar things, California, Connecticut, Ohio, just to name a few. Um, and it's going to be a big challenge for how to implement this. There's a mandate, but there's no funding behind it. Um, and you know, the community is really scrambling to figure out how to get the word out to teachers and school districts and how to actually get the curriculum taught. So I just want to make a couple of more uh, major points, if that's OK. Uh, one thing I think is really important for students to take away and for us to take away is that racism isn't about individual hate, but about systemic oppression. So in addition to learning that Asian Americans have and do face racism, um, it's important to learn that systemic history. Um, and I think that also a lesson in the Vincent Chin case is that the difficulty in proving that Evans had a racial motivation to kill and the whole case having to hinge on that very fact shows the limits of defining racism as an individual motivation. So, you know, one racist man did not kill Vincent Chen. And that's why I also think the title of the film is so brilliant. Um, I think racism, sexism, you know, toxic masculinity, uh, capitalism killed Vincent Chen. So only understanding uh, racism as an exceptional phenomenon of a single racist individual continues to perpetuate the false idea that the US system is not racist. Uh, critical race theory, or CRT, which is being so maligned by those who do not want histories of racism to be taught in schools, is critical. Um, and its premise is that racism is not an anomaly of the system, but is ingrained in the US political, social, legal, cultural institutions. Um, so, um, you know, it provides an explanation for why the trial outcomes of Vincent Chin's killers were actually the logical outcomes of our system, not an outrageous exception. Uh, so CRT is not being taught in elementary schools. It's probably taught in law schools and college of educations at the graduate level. But ethnic studies and Asian American studies really needs to be taught for that reason. So students can recognize the forces that oppress all of us and that keep us divided and learn about people who have worked actively to change these systems of oppression together. And I just want to end um, by highlighting a few more questions we might ask around what is justice. Um, Asian Americans engaged with abolishing police and prison systems are raising questions. Should we be seeking justice through trying to fix the legal system, which is very racist and has disproportionately harmed black and indigenous people? Does making Vincent Chin's killers and other perpetrators of anti-Asian violence, um, does making sure they're convicted, jailed, and fined uh, actually get us to the justice we ultimately want? Uh, concerns have been raised about hate crimes databases becoming a way to increase policing. So how do we fight anti-Asian violence and seek community safety in a non-carceral way? I think these are huge, huge questions, but kind of reflect um, where I would focus on in this current moment with my students when we learn about this agenda. Thanks. Professor Sue for setting the stage for us, providing a little bit more, con well, a lot more context, really, about everything that happened and why it led up to what happened. 
And also, it's important to note that she mentioned that, yes, the TEACH Act is a success. It's a milestone that we should celebrate, but it also requires more funding to back it. So our educators are scrambling. That's one action item for all of you and for everyone that's watching on the stream is to look into, into the TEACH Act, support your fellow educators, and encourage other states to enact their version of the TEACH Act and fund it as well. Thank you so much. So now I'd like to talk about one of the organizations that, uh, so Karen brought up that in the early 1980s, there were various organizations that came about um, in the AAPI community. And one of them in particular was NEPALSA, the National Asian Pacific American Law Student Association. JD candidate Faith Lee is the president of the UIC Nepalsa chapter, and she will be talking about AAPI law students and what they've made the community impact they've made, and the stances that Nepalsa has taken on recent injustices. Please give the floor to Faith B. Um, first of all, I want to say, I so wish you were my teacher at one point. That would be really cool, and I would be further along than I am now. But um, thank you for that introduction, Karen. It was really great context to set up, I guess, what we'll talk about now. Um, so I, I kind of want to first start off about the Asian American law student. Um, kind of uh, experience. I can speak a little bit from the heart <laughs> to that. So um, I'm like a non-traditional first generation um, law student. I think navigating a space that wasn't necessarily open or not a lot of representation um, in it and like often feeling imposter in that space was initially pretty scary and hard for me. But um, uh, organizations like Apalso really offered a sense of belonging and community to me. So Apalsa really is just like focused on community building and um, really focusing on how to build power within our own community and then using that power to like build other communities as well. So I think, um, you know, these times <laughs> are pretty tough and being a, you know, a law student it, when it seems like all of our rights are being taken away. It's been a pretty interesting experience being a law student, especially an Asian American one. So um, when I think about a Pulsa, I'm, um, I just remember like how important community is and being able to work with other people who understand your struggles, like mentorship through that and, and the connections you make um, through a Pulsa has been, uh, I think, so, so, so important. Um, representation and seeing other people go through the experience with you and being able to process a lot of things um, has been, I think, what has helped me really get through a space that isn't necessarily all that welcoming. <laughs> um, and so, you know, with the rise of anti-Asian, you know, hate, we have taken a lot of stances um, as an organization. Um, like Karen said, a lot of students are out there doing the work and we, um, uh, have built a lot of solidarity solidarity statements with other you know, like clubs in um, Illinois. So we connect with students at DePaul College of Law, Chicago Kent, and you know, in response to the rising, you know, attacks on like our elders and the shootings in Atlanta, we put out an open letter to the community and hope to like formally denounce like um, what Karen was saying, what we know like the root of the issue being is systemic racism and you know the anti-Asian xenophobic rhetoric that was rampant during the Trump administration. So we really wanted to take a, a loud stance about that. So with that open letter, we offered other students um, resources on how to report um, um, anti-Asian instances of um, hate and then also we um, gave resources on how to be an effective bystander and intervene when you see something. I think, you know, oftentimes being, not doing anything is like complicity in the situation is very a hard skill and something that's not taught to people. So being able to connect um, students with that resource I thought was super important. Um, I think a lot of what Apulsa does too is just a lot of internal hard work. So um, with the Atlanta shootings, you know, processing grief and, 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 and dealing with all of that, it can be pretty isolating. Um, you know, these things often are really hard to process, but 
you know, I think it, it does a lot and galvanizes the community to come together. So we um, really practiced a lot of restorative circles in that time to have open dialogue about how we were feeling and, you know, being able to be with other people in that moment was, uh, I think, really helpful, even, you know, through virtual <laughs> virtual school. So, um, being a space, a hall is like a space for us to like heal together too. Um, um, another thing we really are trying to work on, there's always more work to do, is um, kind of figuring out, deconstructing and navigating all the like internalized racism and all the issues in our own community. So um, we are trying to partner with you know other organizations um, of like marginalized people, so BOLSA, the Black Student Law Association, and ELSA, the Latino Law Student Association. You know, I'm a firm believer of my liberation is tied to your liberation, and it's been, you know, known that Asian Americans stood alongside other oppressed people, so I think we're trying to, you know, be mindful about standing alongside in solidarity to all other students who may be going through the similar struggles that we are. Um, so um, we partner with Bolsa to do, you know, panels and um, really talk through what it means, you know, what colorism is like in the Asian community, what and how anti-blackness plays out, and you know, how we can be better allies to the black community. Um, we partnered with ELSA during the Trump administration when there were ICE raids on um, ensuring that students um, from from immigrant families and you know their families had access to uh, like know your rights um, um, like campaigns. Um, you know, <laughs> I think that's a lot of what we do. Uh, I just want to say that I really do lean on this community. It's such a movement to be together, and um, they brought me here, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, as Faith has brought up, there are multiple efforts of very, across various organizations to build solidarity and to build awareness around the issues that we're facing today. And of those many issues is the idea that hate crimes are not being processed, it's hate crimes. And so I'd like to give the floor to Ann Shaw, civil rights attorney, and uh, I'm not sure if you want an iPad or on the screen, but uh, she will be talking to all of you about hate crimes and uh, from her perspective. Please give the floor to Ann Shaw.
which is which is very encouraging. So um, you know, but we really have to think and thank uh, Lily Chen for having that bravery to come forward um, in such a tragic situation to help us spark this modern Asian American uh, civil rights movement. In fact, uh, the term Asian American is also kind of uh, radical and radical revolutionary. It really wasn't used widespreadly until what happened with Vincent Chen. And the idea was to unite the Asian American community together and, um, you know, fight these injustices and these anti-bias. I hope that helps answer the question. Thank you so much, Anne. We're hearing themes about solidarity, about speaking up, and in this case, um, it was important that the mother of Vincent Chin and the mother of Emmett Till stood up and, show, and stood for their, their son and made a statement. So what are we all doing today? The elephant in the room at any AAPI event that discusses race and violence from what I've experienced is talking about anti-blackness. What we learned from Professor Sue's presentation is that we have a long history of solidarity with the black community. And in fact, our history of civic engagement and advocacy was modeled on black movements. Urban ecologist and artist Consuela Hendricks and artist and community organizer Angela Lin, both from the organization People Matter, uh, we'll talk about how to tackle anti-blackness and how to build solidarity. Please give the floor to Suela and Angela. Yeah, so thank you everyone for coming here and thank you all our panelists, Victoria for inviting us. Um, I want to just first say a little bit about People Matter. So we are a very, we're a baby organization, we're about three years old. We sort of are um, centering in Chicago's very own Chinatown, and the reason um, for doing race relations work, and the reason for that is we that we believe that Chinatown is a really key component in racial healing um, across communities of color and white communities, and that by working through Chinatown and doing and tackling anti-blackness in Chinatown, we can really make an impact on a lot of communities of color. Um, just like black, brown, we can do um, a lot of racial healing among all communities of color because Asian Americans have often been used as a wedge to, you know, divide black and brown folks, um, you know, further divide them and further marginalize them um, at the benefit of white supremacy. So I just want to say a little bit about what we do. Um, so we do a lot of like really grassroots work. So we work with a lot of communities. So we work in Chinatown. We work with low income, limited English proficiency Chinese folks and um, tackle anti-blackness among our community members. So I think that's also a really important distinction because um, a lot of Chinatowns throughout the U.S. live, um, they are very multi-racial, they're very diverse. Um, there's not just Chinese people in Chinatown, in Chinatowns all across um, the U.S. and internationally. And so um, because of that, a lot of Chinese people are in proximity to a lot of black folks. They live together, they work together, they go to school together, they go to the same hospitals, and there's a lot of racial tension that happens within these like daily interactions. And so a lot of what we do is just like making sure that in these daily interactions that you know low-income people of color have with each other, that there is not further harm, there is not um, further marginalization of black folks or you know xenophobia. Um, and so yeah, I think that's a really important um, part of what we do. It's, it's very grassroots and among people who are really most marginalized by systems of white supremacy, xenophobia, um, and classism. And I also want to say that I really consider myself the brawn and consider the brains of the whole operation. So I learned so much about Asian American identity through Consuela. And when I first started organizing in Chinatown five years ago, she was there for much longer way longer than me, she's a, um, she's a fourth generation, she can talk more about herself, but you know, she um, has been in Chinatown for way longer. She was really a mentor to me in doing race relations work and even organizing work when I first came to Chinatown. So I just want to pass it to you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, my mom was actually born in like Chinatown, like, <laughs> like where I used to the Jocelyn Hotel. She was like, it was a hospital, used to be there. My mom was born there. 
Um, but anyway, like, um, I've been in Chinatown for about like 11 years. Um, since I was 16 years old, I've been working in that community for a while, organizing the community, listening to my friends and stuff like that, and learning more about like Asian American history. In addition to that, um, apparently I had like a different uh, relationship with Asian American history than Angela, because she didn't get taught it in school, but I did. And I went to all black schools, so they taught it. So I was like, <laughs> and I was just telling Angela about it. She's like, I didn't learn that. I was like, what? I was like, how did I learn it? You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that that is something that is unique about me, I guess. <laughs> but um, with that, though, I do think that when tackling anti blackness and specifically the Asian American community, I think it is sometimes very difficult. Um, and I think that it's difficult because of like sometimes people, like in Chinatown, it was really hard to get people to acknowledge that it was a thing, right? A lot of people are like, don't speak about it because if you talk about us being in stuff like this, it's gonna make us seem racist. And my response to that is that everyone, I have a strong belief, everyone is racist. We live in a white supremacist system. It is no way that you can make it out without being racist. If you're the one racist person out of millions and billions of people, then congratulations. <laughs> so, like, seriously though, like, there's no way to make it out, right? And so I would talk to like our like elders in the community and like talk to them like, we have to acknowledge this, right? Because we have like black people in the community like sacrificing the like daily lives just to be here to teach Chinese kids, to help Chinese seniors, and just doing all these things for the community. But at the same time, you're really you're willing to run them out at midnight or at like when the sun goes down, right? And oftentimes Chinatown does feel like a sundown neighborhood, right? Um, and unsafe for black folks to even exist in. Uh, and I think that the part of the work we do is like having these conversations with folks, making people think in a different way, showing the connections, showing the ways that we can build solidarity, showing the ways that lines can be drawn to, and showing the humanity with one another too. Because I think that a lot of times humanity is lost in a lot of these conversations. Um, and our job in in Chinatown, and specifically like in other neighborhoods too, is to build that bridge. And I think that what we consistently do is try to have the community build these bridges. And we've had a program called Community Breaking Bubbles, where we have different community members come together and break these bubbles that people like are putting themselves in and not necessarily crossing these like these lanes, right? Um, yeah, and I, I think that that's something that we try to do. And I'm hesitant to just those that. Definitely. So one of our really successful programs um, that's ongoing right now is our Cantonese language program. So it's our community language program, and um, so a lot of things that a lot of things that we hear is a lot of um, American-born Chinese folks or American-born, um, you know, uh, folks of color. Um, they aren't necessarily connected to you know their immigrant parents' language and can't even communicate with their parents. So a lot of times when we ask people to like knock on doors, you know, tell your community members about what's happening, they're like, I have no idea what to say to them. I don't know the vocabulary. I don't know the first thing about talking about politics or race or things like that. So that was why that was something that kept coming up. So that's why um, Consuela invented the community language program where we teach people about we teach people how to speak um, in Cantonese, talk about their mental health, tell their stories talk about race um, with their family members. And we also have, um, we teach like Chinese immigrant mothers mainly from the local schools how to speak English and you know talk about civic engagement, I'll talk to their aldermen, write the representative. So it's like a dual immersion program and then there's an aspect where you, you bring it together and so the native English speakers teach the Cantonese, the native Cantonese speakers and vice versa. So it's like a very intentional program that you know, um, bridges language barriers among uh, community members of color, um, bridges language barriers among Chinese Americans um, and their parents, as well as builds community. Um, so a lot of people are local school teachers, you know, they're, um, they just like live near each other. Um, so that is something that, you know, language, like being able to, um, I think for our Asian Americans speaking, you know, myself as Chinese American, um, it's really important for us to talk to our community members and to be able to like have that conversation and have a really deep conversation. Um, and also with that, we need to know like our own histories, we need to know our parents' history. And you know, my mom personally was, you know, our family was like, persecuted in the Cultural Revolution, so they have, you know, trauma of war and things like that. And so also being very trauma informed about that and connecting that to, you know, um, Black liberation, and you know, oftentimes with my mom, it would be like, Oh, we work so hard, and you know, like black people don't work as hard, or why did we get here and they can't get here? But then, you know, there's a whole history of systemic racism, anti blackness behind that, 
And so being able to talk about that to her Chinese and talk to Kami members, you know, any Kami member I see in the street about that, um, that's just a really important aspect to, you know, protect the black folks in our community, um, and who, you know, who give their entire lives um, to Chinese communities. So I think like, being able to talk to your community um, is really important. Yeah, I don't know how we are on time, but I would like to bring up like, um, we just had like a national tour basically that happened where we went to like three different Chinatowns across the nation from New York to San Francisco and California. And we basically had these conversations and what we found was that it's a, I know this sounds weird, but there's a lot of black people in these communities that are like serving the Chinese American community, that are serving the Asian American community and like are like literally just like making sure they have, you know, like language access, making sure people are taken care of, like literally laying down a lot of hours. Like so many people are nominated and they were like, hey, they're like putting in all this time to like support the community. And then, and so we even have like this, um, this program that we have like, you know, this celebration we have each year is called like Black Heroes of Chinatown, which celebrates like, you know, Black folks in Chinatown. And I think that a lot of times people are like, why do you have that? Like, that doesn't make sense. But it's like, because like a lot of times to be a black person working in Chinatown is a lot, right? Like, I have to also deal with racism, I have to deal with sexism, I have to deal with everything. <laughs> and like, I put myself in a very vulnerable um, situation, right? Um, but also, I believe in like, our liberations are tied together, right? Um, like Faith said. And so, because I believe that, I believe that I just can't leave other people behind <laughs> because I'm just seeking my liberation. I can't just only worry about like, black folks. I can't just only worry about one group over another, right? I feel like I have to worry about everyone else equally and I have to see myself in other people, right? Just because you don't look like me doesn't mean I can't fight for you, right? And I think that that's something that I hold true to my heart and I make sure that I continuously work hard to do that. And I think that so many other people, even across the nation, that's doing the, that's doing the same thing because they believe the same thing as well. Okay, good morning, Dr. Consuela. Um, this is Anne again. Real quick, I, I forgot. First of all, I, 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 I fully hear you, Consuela. Uh, I actually co founded an organization, a national organization called Women of Color Coalition. I totally forgot about it. Uh, but we, we, we formed two free bridges between communities of color. And I will tell the last two years that we've been working on it, um, I have learned so much from the black community. Right? Like we talk real, like we don't hold anything back. And it's really amazing to have those safe spaces. And yes, we talked about um, anti-blackness within the Asian community, but I also found a lot of, um, on the other side, a lot of misunderstanding about Asians within the black community. when we forget that we have supported each other on a bigger level. So it is something that I, I feel as, as Asian Americans, it's our responsibility um, to uh, build those bridges and work within our own Asian communities to overcome that. Because really, together, we're stronger instead of fighting each other. Because we experience a lot of the same things, not quite the same extent of it, but that's why I started out talking about the similarities between Emmett, Emmett Till and Vincent Chin. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you, Consuela. Thank you, Angela.
had free time, <laughs> I would um, I would be in like social justice spaces, and, and that felt really invigorating for me. So um, I felt like I wanted to make like a, a direct impact on like like, like the legal system, frankly. So. Um, I just get excited about prison abolition and stuff like that. So I figured, I guess I'll go to law school because teaching was really hard. So um, I think my goal in law school is to, you know, with, you know, do what I can to, you know, get rid of the carceral state and, and, and like uh, redefine what justice looks like. Um, I don't have an answer for what that looks like right now, but. I'm just trying to do a little bit of work each day to work towards that. I can tell you why I went to law school. <laughs> I'm just interested. It goes ancient history. I think it's very nice. I wasn't actually going to go to law school because I'm like, uh, I don't want to fight for a living. But um, uh, my father actually uh, was the first Asian American. I would say I would say look inward when tackling like anti-racism in general. Know your history, right? I think that a lot of people need to connect to their own personal history because you can't know you can't write for stuff that you don't know, right? Connect to history, and also I would say have conversations with friends and family about it too, and keep like building community around it because I think that that's something that's really important. And also stand up when you see something's happening, right? Don't just stand around and say, if you see something, say something, right? So I think that that's also some ways that people can stand up against anti hate do you want to add to that? So like you're saying exactly about standing up when you see uh, instances of hate and bystander intervention, you could take bystander intervention classes. Um, I'm not sure if your organization offers it, but if not, uh, there's also uh, Asian American Advancing Justice Chicago. They offer them online as well. So learn more, be prepared for when the moment does happen. And if unfortunately it does happen, then you'll be ready to be a, a helpful bystander. in like wherever you live, maybe look at what's happening in a school in your neighborhood, in your community, and see if they are teaching Asian American curriculum, and um, maybe work with other people in your community, family members, um, students, to look at how to get that to happen. Um, 
To add to that, so the TEACH Act, as you mentioned, uh, Asian American Investment Justice Chicago also has a web page on um, resources that educators could use. But even though you're not, an if, even if you're not an educator, you could still reference them. And also, you could reach out to your local library and make sure that they're stocking more um, racially relevant and important uh, books and media about. Uh, the issues that we're facing so that everyone uh, from young to old can access them accessibly. <laughs> Along the same lines, I also used to be a teacher, have since switched three times in my career when I am. But um, I know that Teach Act is in service, in established, and I come from, I, born and raised in Boston and Massachusetts is well known for its well as established institutions and I feel like they're light years away from Illinois at this point. Uh, but I was thinking like what resources or what action steps would you recommend taking um, in regards to actually putting curriculum inside the classroom. I know I used to teach elementary school and it's one thing to have it as mandatory Another to kind of slide it in with social studies, you know, or put it into science classes, and that's not really hitting all the marks. Not just an extracurricular, not just extra credit. So, thinking about that, I know that was a long question. Any tips or suggestions? I just wanted to react to what you were saying. Like, if, if any teacher is slipping it in, that's great. <laughs> Because from what I've seen in terms of the schools that my kids have gone to, it's like they really get very, very, very little. So anything a teacher can do would be great. Um, beyond that, um, I don't know. I feel like since you were a former teacher, you might actually have some insights into what are the best ways to reach teachers and um, you know, point them to websites and curriculum that's available. Um, I know a lot of times um, when I have brought up things to my kids' teachers, for instance, they would say, oh, well, I can teach it if you give me what to teach. And even though I am a professor <laughs> in age very studies, like, and I could give them stuff, I, you know, not all parents could do that, but also I just really kind of um, feel like that's such a limited response. Like, I would want teachers to say, oh, that's something I could incorporate. Let me go learn more so I can incorporate it. And yes, I think we could support teachers to do that, uh, but I don't want the, yeah, the response to be, oh, well, parents who want something to be taught, the parents have to bring it in. Um, so I don't know if that's not I did want to say in Boston, there's an amazing uh, Asian American studies teacher who's part of the uh, Boston Teachers Union who is really pushing for Asian American studies curriculum. Professor Sir, did you work on the medieval Chinese I, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I was, uh, I, I did work on the TCAC and I, I joined the committee that I worked on the curriculum for the TCAC and, uh, and I know you're in Boston, but um, kind of try, like, so we, we did, we were given a huge, I mean, we found a huge amount of, uh, of materials, uh, LPBS, they did the two week uh, Asian American history documentary. They also have, uh, believe it or not, it's really fascinating that they that series kind of also was an inspiration for us. But they also have teaching materials for uh, teacher 
that maybe you could get some ideas. But I mean, for your own self, I would definitely check out uh, like the, I think it's still on their website, the PBS website, where they can actually download um, for free their teaching materials. Right. This is Karen again. Um, yeah, if you go to um, Chicago's Asian Americans Advancing Justice website, the curriculum that's been put together is available. And there are actually other organizations that are doing lots of teacher workshops. And um, there, if people are interested, you're welcome to also email me and I can put you in touch with some of these organizations. But um, I was just thinking, like, I have a lot of friends who do just ask their kids' teachers to say, I'm going to come into the classroom and teach something. You know, I haven't actually done that. They have. There's also um, friends who are running for school board, right? Um, so there's a lot of ways you can get involved. I, I just think it. <laughs> I was going to say, like, um, but yeah, I, I do teach a lot, teach a lot of classes, um, but it was more like in an informal way, like a pop, a pop of education classes. Um, but definitely, um, I teach this class called like, Yellow Skin, but it's more with the combination of like through a black historical lens, and also it does it through like teaching the class is like kind of but it's like teaching like Asian Americans their history through like a black historical lens, which sounds weird, but it, it's like a lot of our history like lines up together. And I guess I found like new ways to teach people about history through things that they're interested in. Um, and the same thing I did it did one for like um, the Latino community as well, like um, talk about like the workforce, the workforce, and like from Mandy Mark. I guess my, my thing is like my name is one of classes I've already talked about you know, salacious but from Mandy to Maria, that's what it's called. And it's talk about like the story of domestic workers in America and like how that relates. So I, I guess like I try to do like a combination of both, like or not combination of both, but you know, like something that's interesting, like a topic that people don't really think about and then another topic and I add it in and then like people are really interested in the class. And I think one way to do it is through like pop education too. So they necessarily have to have it in school to invite people to come to you to learn to. And I think that that's another way that you can have like kids do it after school programs. Like I talk to a lot of my like Chinese students about like their history and stuff like that. And I like and I talk to black students about like Chinese American history too. So like I think that it's different ways that you can have these conversations and like even in an informal, non institutional way. So. Yeah, and I would add that um, I think that like I feel like. I mean, I went to elite like, college, like high school, all this kind of stuff. But I feel like my education didn't really start until I graduated and I started working in Chinatown. I feel like that's when like I learned so much about myself, my history, and like you know the world. So I do feel like there is something to say about like um, well education outside of institutions, but also I think just oral history. Oral history from your parents could be like a, that's what textbooks can't capture, you know. And um, like from, you know, like old black folks on the street can tell a lot of things that like aren't in um, textbooks that are very true or, you know, like captured truths. And then um, I would also say that, you know, the whole education system, at least like if we're talking about Chicago public schools, has so many um, ways that it fails students. I mean, currently the um, Board of Ed just had their budget vote, you know, yesterday. And a lot of schools, almost I believe every single elementary school in Chicago, public schools, will have um, budget cuts, funding cuts. So, you know, in Chinatown, we're losing $500,000 for just one school. And so, you know, even within the school systems, it's really hard because you have to do with like funding and like, you know, like how can you support the teachers? Are the teachers going to get cut? You know, like all these things. Um, so I think that it gets really complicated in the school system. Of course, there are like some really amazing ways to do it. And that's like ultimately the goal, right? That it would be systematized and taught in schools. But I also, yeah, do want to just echo the, um, like the, all the things you can learn, like from community, from just like conversations. Um, I want to just pop off of what Angela Consuelo said, but um, one tool that I found very helpful in class is like, um, uh, circles and I know they're tough sometimes and <laughs> especially with elementary students but I think once you build like a structure around this is like how we do it this is like the culture of the classroom um, it, it's a really great way to like learn who your students are and I think it's 
pretty cool to start at like an elementary school level exploring themes um, that like you know transcend just like Asian American experiences but like everybody's experiences and you know along the way that'll help us in high school so we'd appreciate that too so that's just like one instructor I found like super helpful in like understanding my students and then building um, community around like Asian American and other you know oppressed identities and being able to talk about that frequently. So I want to wrap this up with a final question to all the panelists. Um, there's another elephant in the room. It's that we don't have enough people here in the room. How do we encourage people within our community in Chicago to be more, to feel that this is something important to, to discuss and to show up and learn more about? How can we convince our community to get more engaged and activated in general? <laughs> My friends are here, so. <laughs> Consuela has a children's book.
Yeah, I think that um, that's like a big, um, you know, tension among community organizing is like the work and the play aspect. Like a lot of people, like they love, um, you know, free pizza, they love like barbecues, hangouts, and just, of course, we all want to build community, but then there's also like, we're building community too. Dismantle my supremacy and tackle, you know, violence, things like that. You're like, uh, okay, <laughs> that part. And so, um, but I, I, I do think that, so it's like a balance, but then I would also say that it's like a very long-term thing. Um, so, I mean, you know, uh, this one organizer that um, we talked to, Alex Tom from Chinese Progressive Association in San Francisco, was saying like when people come into the org, he says like, are you on the one year track, two year track, five year track, ten year track? Like how many years do you want to be doing this work? Um, or like, so that's like how many hours do you spend on anti-black work? Like how, what really is um, like people's commitment? And I think that like to be really committed to this kind of work, it is a really long-term, really intentional, like, I'm doing this, I'm fighting injustice, <laughs> it's, um, sure. you know, and it is a long-term thing. So I think that, you know, like, as, um, like, these, and, you know, Victoria, you are building it too, you know, so it's like, the more, like, the, the second screening maybe would be like a packed room, you know, like the third screening, right? <laughs> like, really, the, the like, repetition and, like, the, the time that it takes to build community is really, like, underrated, I think. Yeah. I totally agree, yeah, like, repetition, just keep doing it, do it, because, like, if you do it, like, every year, then people, like, who live here will spread the word, like, oh, I went here last year, blah, blah, and, like, I think that, like, also, like, building the brand behind it, because I think this is, like, maybe the first time doing it, or maybe you did it another time, and it's just different, but, you know, like, it's, like, I think, like, building that community around it, like, talking about it, having conversations leading up to it, too, like, different sessions leading up to this big, one big conversation, right? I think we like, yeah, I'm a programmer, I do the program set, that's my job. Street <laughs> runner, <laughs> well, program. But yeah, that's the way you can do it too. So yeah. Wait, what would you not do? <laughs> <laughs> Understanding and only love can cure hate. Right? So, thinking that if I were Vincent Chin, if they make fun of me or talk of the bad, bad language, I would just walk out. He would have been still living. But it was confrontational. He says, Why should you call me me? I wasn't even Japanese, and then you blame me. For that. So he was confrontational and therefore provoked more violence by the two, the, 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 the father and the stepson, and so forth. So if I were, well, number one, I don't go to those clubs anyway. Right? So that's the thing that you should not even do. If I was discriminated too in high school, I, I came when I was, it was 1963, I went to high school. Not too many uh, Chinese students in this high school. And people make fun. And they, they bully because I was small and got bullied. But if I I have a friend who is bigger than me, and then when they got discriminated or make fun of, he would fight. I stay away. <laughs> That's the way to not uh, provoke more violence. Right? So, so then always think of the golden rule. If you don't want to, somebody to do something to you, then you don't do something to them. So the compassion, the understanding, avoiding anything that is dangerous. Okay? Of course, if you are helpless, then you fight everybody, right? But that's not the answer. Just avoiding the situation, then would be the, the right thing to do. So always think of, uh, like, commit a random act of kindness. Think about that. If we do that, if everybody is doing that, we would have a lot better world. See what I'm saying? I know it's not easy to do. Uh, for example, I sell real estate in Bridgeport, and 
many of the Chinese buyers, they pay more to buy the property. But then the long time residents in the neighborhood could not afford it because they, and so forth. So they hate the Chinese for buying their property, that they were born there, they couldn't even afford it. So that's another form of discrimination, right? In a way, uh, comparing, right? So if you don't compare, then, then there's a lot better situation. So compassion, understanding, stay away from any confrontational situations. Even though you are a stronger person, you don't want to hurt that person because you are stronger. If you are the one bullying, that's not good, right? That's no compassion for the person who is bullying, right? So staying away from any confrontational would be the way to survival for the fittest. Right? <laughs> okay. If Thank I you. may add, um, I totally understand where you're coming from, and yeah. I do not promote violence as well. Yeah. But I think my concern, especially as Asian Americans, is that we keep our heads down so low because we are afraid of that confrontation. We're afraid of, especially me as an immigrant, my citizen being revoked. Me when Trump became president, knowing uh, the Basin case where like citizenship was easily revoked. Very scared of trying to stand up. But I think there's a difference between um, confronting and like acts of violence versus this act of encouraging and promoting and upholding white supremacy. I think when you're standing up for yourself versus when you're standing up for your people versus when you're strictly trying to attack someone, there is a very fine line of difference. And what I do agree with, like Vincent did not have to come and attack someone for um, you know being racist towards him but at the same time there is I support fully support the aspect of trying to stand up for the people who he was a citizen for his dad who was a US um, part of the US Army and who sacrificed his life and his generation's life to make a difference and I think that is self in terms of even my aspect of you know, providing um, you know upholding my elders I do not want my parents who sacrificed their life to be in America, to be disrespected like that. And thus, even though I do agree strongly with what you mean about that, violence is not the act and not the answer. I think when violence becomes the only thing that you do, and not saying that, you know, what was justified, but violence is also a form of um, resistance against the, uh, the systematic, systematic issues that have been at place. And I think that's where revolutions come in. I don't know if you guys have anything to say about that. Yeah. Um, I would say that um, I think that sometimes, like, I think that, well, I guess I'll quote one of my teachers said, like, when has anyone ever gained freedom by appealing to the morals of the oppressor, right? And, and I think that if someone was morally righteous, they wouldn't be oppressing you. And no matter what you do, they still would oppress you. So it's no way for us to really figure out what Vincent would never been murdered or not. What if that guy was just like, I was going to murder him if he turned away. I was going to murder him if he loved, blah, blah. And I think that. You know, as a black American, I can even talk about it. It's plenty of times black people walk away from stuff and still get killed and murdered, right? Still get hung on a tree and people eating, like, eating that, you know, picnics afterwards, right? And I, and I think that, that I think sometimes it's easier for us as people of color to blame ourselves and say, if we did something better in a situation, we would never have been harmed. But in the actual reality, the system is violent. And regardless of what we do, we will always receive some type of violence because of it, whether we hold our head down or we hold our heads high. And I think that that's something that is hard to deal with as a person of color, too, because you have to be like, you're like, if I, well, maybe if I never said this, and maybe if I walked away, maybe blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you're always a target because you're a person of color. You don't look like them. You're not white. You know, you're never going to be them. And because of that, you will always receive violence because of that. And even when you try to reclaim some type of land and some type of, like, reparations for your freedom or your liberation, you will still get violence towards you. Because there's so many Chinese Americans and Asian Americans that receive violence in this country based on them just like, just existing. But also like, even with California and gold rush, during the gold rush and stuff like that, like, you know, building spaces and like, building community around there and still being like, massacres happening in, in that area and them being killed and murdered because white people felt like they were taking that land, right? And I think that just keeping in mind that I don't know. I just feel like sometimes, like, I think that I, the emotion you feel is very relatable in the sense of, like, you know, as people of color, I think we blame ourselves a lot. But I think that 
we, is we're ultimately not responsible for the system that we are placed in.
So I actually draw parallels to uh, rape cases in the sense that in, those, in a lot of those cases, they would argue that the victim had worn something inappropriate or went down at a, t kind of a night of, uh, the time of night that it is too late for them to be out alone as a single woman. Um, or that they went to a place that was dangerous and therefore they placed themselves in a position to get drunk and be drugged and then be raped. And so I think in, in, the, in drawing those parallels, what I'm trying to say is what everyone else is saying is that we need to look at the action of the perpetrator and not think that the victim had played a part in the act of violence that was uh, against them. So um, I'm not sure, Priscilla, did you have something else to add? Just to jump on what everybody else said, I think I totally agree. Like, hate does you know, hate doesn't drive out hate, and like, resistance is a form of love, and like, loving your community enough to hold us accountable. So that's just how I view it. You know. I, guess I, think, I just wanted to say that um, people did do something, right? And that's why we are here. And I think it's really important to keep remembering that, that sure, there's still a lot that needs to be done, but so much has already been done that we have to keep building on that. And I really liked, you know, the first question that was asked, like what's something every day a person can do? And, you know, however long you can keep doing that, something every day, I, I think that's going to make a difference. I, I hear all of you, and what you're saying is that we need to do events like this over and over again. Yeah. And I really appreciate thank you. I really appreciate all of you coming out here, spending your Thursday night. You could be out there at the bar, but you're here. Uh, spending your time with us learning about this history that's really important. It's not just history, I mean it's happening every day in our in our lives. So I hope that all of you, what your takeaway, what your takeaways can be is that one, get your friends and family engaged, have them show up uh, to events like these. We'll continue hosting events like these and all of you panelists, I hope all of you can continue supporting us in doing so. And then the second thing is talk to your fellow educators about the TEACH Act. Uh, get more resources into our schools and into our libraries to make it more accessible for people. And to talk to your friends and family and have conversations in languages that they understand and in uh, the context that they can understand to build relationships, genuine relationships with your community so that they are more likely, more willing to care about these issues and to come out with you to events like these. And so on behalf of all of our partners from Chicago Asian Women Empowerment, from Asian Justice Movement, People Matter, and all of the uh, partners listed in our flyer, uh, we appreciate all of you for coming, all of our panelists, and the Wing Chicago for being such a gracious host. Thank you so much for helping organize all of this. And we look forward to seeing everyone at our next event. Thank you. <laughs>